Welcome to another episode of A Different Perspective Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Green. Uh, today, I got one of the most talked about trending person people in the social media space, man. Uh, you know, he's a former bad boy artist. And, uh, you know, like I said, he's been making noise all over the, the, the airwaves concerning the controversy surrounding Diddy. You know what I'm saying? So without further ado, man, what's up, Mark? Mark Curry. How you doing? What's, what's going on? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, what's going on, man? Loving life, doing it, <clears throat> maintaining. That's all, you know. It's keeping my SUV in my own lane. Yeah, you know? yeah. So, uh, yeah. man, you know, uh, even though you've been all over the place, some people may not know who you are, man. So, can you you mind introducing yourself? Yeah, I'm Mark Curry. <clears throat> It's hard to really explain this sometimes because when I think about me, I, th I think about, you know, not only am I an artist, I'm like, I've been good friends for people. I've been people that help, you know, help people throughout life. I'm a friend, first and foremost, I'm a brother. Um, I'm a former bad boy recording artist, but I was, I'm just gifted with the way, with words, I'm gifted with, making sentences make sense for people. Um, I'm gifted with taking visions and bringing them to life. It's hard to really explain what kind of title that is because there's really no title for that. Um, what I can say to you is I'm your brother. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, man. You know, I recorded a lot of music. Music for, I gave people words to say to inspire the world. I gave people words to say to make the world dance. Um, that back and watched it all. I enjoyed it. And today, here I am. I'm a book author. I'm a master carpenter. Because there's so many ways that we can do things in life. We don't have to limit ourselves. Yeah. Yeah, man. So uh, Amongst other morally correct. <clears throat> yeah. So, you know, I'm going to start it off. Like I told you when we talk, you know what I'm saying? Like, I'm a real individual. You know what I'm saying? I ain't going to cut no corners or nothing like that. So I'm going to ask the question that a lot of people have been talking about, but ain't nobody got the opportunity to ask because nobody asked, right? So a lot of people are asking, after all this time, you know what I'm saying? You hear people saying, oh, they probably telling because he didn't make it or whatever the situation is. Right. After all this time, why now? Why come forth with the story now? Because in 2009, I wrote a book. And if they ain't heard about the book in 2009 and they're asking me that question, I'm going to say, why now? Why are you asking me that question now? Why didn't you know who I was back then when I was saying this long time ago? So right now, a lot of people is just playing catch up. They mustered, didn't understand. <laughs> yeah. Why now? Um, sometimes the timing wasn't right. You know, I mean? we don't look for, does it happen in, in my time? It happens in God's time. Is, is it all right if I if I refer to, to the highest power as a God? Yeah, yeah. One of, and no one who, who might not, you know, might not have no religious background. So I don't want to do that. But it's everything happens in God's time. And it, and it doesn't matter if it doesn't happen how I want to happen. But is the way it's supposed to happen so i didn't wait this long if you're just now knowing about me that means you're just now reading what's going on i don't have to slow myself up for you to catch up sometimes you got to catch up because i'm moving i've been moving the book that i wrote is in 2009 just so happens that when pe people hear about the today's news and what's going on in today's tabloids, they're saying that, hey, you know what, you're trying to take advantage of a man that's being kicked or a man that's down. But I was a man that was down and nobody was there to pick me up. And I had to realize what I had to do to get back on my own two feet. That was my, my thing. That was my challenge in life. So when people say, why are you just coming out now? I'll be like, why are you just now knowing me? Yeah. So look, Another question that a lot of people pose is there was a uh, there was a clip that's been going around about uh, that uh, it was drinks being spiked in young girls and different stuff like that. Right. And the question is, if you if you guys saw that, then why nobody said nothing? Was it because 
Go ahead. Go ahead. You want to get it off? Go ahead. Then I I come in. You know, uh, was it was it because uh, it would hurt y'all financially, or was it was it because the power that he had at the time was or, or might have? Nah. Um, it was censorship when we used to do music. It means you couldn't say things like "ass bitch," all that kind of stuff on the song. You couldn't curse. Yeah. But you know, they made sure that we had a guideline that we went by. Because when you're an artist and you and you're in music and you're in the lyrics, you're also into giving people the energy that you know you're, you you can create an energy whether it be negative or positive. Right. So when you're into music, <clears throat> especially as a lyricist or artist, <clears throat> you are a very powerful individual. So let's get back. Um, back in when you think about the hip hop hip hop culture. Or even when you think about rock and roll, they say sex, drugs, and rock and roll, right? Right. Do you think they mean sex, marijuana, and rock and roll? No. They talking about sex, big boy drugs, and rock and roll. And it's a slogan that we all abided by. But when we start looking at our culture and we say, hey, um, when Rick Ross said, put Molly all in that champagne, she ain't even know it. Yeah. Home and she didn't even know it. <clears throat> well, if she didn't even know it, that means she really might not have been aware of what was going on. Right. Don't look at me <clears throat> and point the finger because I'm a part of the culture. We was this was everybody who did what they did in life always did what they did because they had a choice. Some right. people walked away. Some people chose to stay. Those who chose to stay wanted to be a part of it. So anytime I saw anything in life or I, I didn't want to be a part of anything in life that I didn't want to be a part of, I walked away. So you had a chance to walk away. If you can tell the story about it, that means you've been through it, right? Right. <clears throat> Whose fault is that? Not bacon, but, you know, it's, it's, it's just what the culture was about um and don't you can't <clears throat> really blame <clears throat> the artist you got to blame those who are in control over the system over the life like they thought that you can take over hip-hop by playing some good music and repetition making people love it and stand and support it give them drugs and then give them some sex it's sex, drugs, and hip hop. Don't fault me. That's just the culture. Yeah. And it was the culture. It ain't it may not been the culture now. It may not be the culture now. But before you question me, you gotta question Rick Ross. You gotta question 50 Cent. He said he got up in the club with some ex. And if you like drugs, he got them. Yeah. Why y'all don't go question him right now before? Like, don't 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 do that to me. Don't don't try to take cheap shots at the king. <laughs> well, let's go, baby. This is getting good. So look, so look, check this out. Now you mentioned when you was talking earlier, we gonna dive into you know what I'm saying a little more. But you you said something about the dark side of hip hop. You know what I'm saying? You mind elaborating on on that? I know I know. Of course, you know. With the with the allegations with Diddy, that's some of it. You know what I'm saying? But is it like other things that you witnessed? Well, <clears throat> what I always noticed was that I, I always noticed the black ball part of it. It means like not black balls, no pause. But like being black ball, I guess it's a reason why they call it black ball, but yeah. If somebody's getting fucked in this situation. Do we curse on the show? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You good? <clears throat> so when we speaking on the black ball situation, that means somebody's getting fucked out of a situation. Yeah, and it's not gonna be comfortable. So you'd be like, either you sit and you let it happen, or you'd be like, nah, you know. Sometimes they just shut you down and say that we're gonna shut you down because we can't put balls in you. Yeah, you're uncontrollable. You're the unballable. Mm. Mm. Yeah, you be they, they sometimes <clears throat> you know if somebody say, Hey, 
um, let's go jump off a bridge. Yeah. You'd be like, well, I really thought about jumping off a bridge. I don't have the desire to jump off the bridge. I never really thought about it. So why don't you go jump off the bridge? And then I'll meet you on the bottom. I know how to get there. Yeah. So you let people do what they want to do. Right? Yeah. You let people live their life, right? Right. So when you're in that situation where you feel like the world is against you, the only thing you can do is defeat all odds. You got to defeat all odds, man. Yeah. So the, the reason why you are blessed is because you believe. What do we believe in? What do we believe in? What do I believe in me? I believe in you too, bro. Appreciate you. Even yeah, I believe in. Us. I believe we can. I believe we can make a difference and change things. I believe in the power of good. So you know, that's who I am. It, it can go back to the first question. Yeah. Yes, sir. So let me ask you this: How did you? <clears throat> how did you get your start with Bad Boy? How did they get they start with me? How did they get they start with you? Yeah. Yeah, I like that question. They got they start with me realizing that if they had me on their team, they're gonna have a Michael Jordan who could always hit them three pointers and come through in the clutch and win for the team. I was Michael Jordan of this before Michael Jordan. Well, I think Michael Jordan was doing basketball when I was doing it. So yeah. that's why, you know, I, I can't never say that I did anything to be on nobody. Because I always believed in my team. So I felt like him being a part of my team was what was the most valuable part. So um, I was just being me, um, understanding that I'm a man on a mission, trying to accomplish a goal, trying to feed the people, trying to make a difference, trying to make a change. All of the positive things that an entertainer or a, a, even an artist, you know, every artist draws a picture. <clears throat> every artist draws a picture and every picture tells a story. Think about what I'm gonna say before I say it. I play chess. Yeah. Avidly. So so what what like you mind you mind sharing with us like how you and Diddy actually got to working together? He noticed that the way that I put words together and the way that I formed sentences to make understanding was something that was the world could relate to fast. And I also was able to put rhythm into it. <clears throat> I was also able to make it make sense and, uh, and to come together to be something great. So he said, hey, can you do me a favor? I said, what's that? He, he said, can you write me some words? And, and, or if I wrote a song and my song was good, he'll say, can I buy your song? I said, hey, you can buy my song. Because I can always go make another song. Yeah. But the most important thing about being an artist is being gifted with words, the way to form words and make them make a sentence to come to understanding. That's who I always. Yeah. You know, he wanted to be a part of that, <clears throat> which was my talent. Which was what God gift me with the ability to God gifted me with the ability to make words come together and make sense. I'm an artist. Yeah. Build. Yeah. He saw that and he needed some of that. He said, can you, can you help me say something the world can love to hear? You remember yeah. that song? Yeah. I songs that make the whole world sing. Songs of all special things. You wrote yeah. that? No, I didn't write that, but then that's what it feels like when you write the songs that make the whole world sing. Yeah. Yeah. So look, man, when you when you while you was on Bad Boy, did you did you and Diddy have a, a good working relationship or just a good personal relationship? I used to do things with him like when we in the studio, I used to be like, yo, yo, let me let me borrow ten but ten dollars. He'd be like, he'd look at me like, what? I'd be like, yeah, let me borrow ten dollars. I'm sorry about that. Let me borrow ten dollars. Yeah. And I'd be like, I need to go to the store. I'm gonna go to McDonald's and give me a hamburger. Then he'd be like, 
Playboy, I don't have no cash. They uh oh, he'll come up with some cash. I go to McDonald's with a hundred dollar bill. I go buy me a Big Mac combo, and then I come back, and then I say, uh, "Here go your change," and I give him like ninety seven dollars back. Ninety seven, ninety. You know, the meal might be ten dollars. You bring him back ninety, and he'd be like, "What is this?" You'd be like, "It's change." He'd be like, "What is change?" Change is what people give you back when you give them a hundred, and the only thing they going in the store is for honey buns. Yeah, the people's so used to people getting a hundred from it, don't bring back change. Yeah, you know when you when we come from, you be like, bro, what's the change? Because you understand the value of a dollar. Yeah, I know what it's like to need ten dollars. Yeah, you know, people don't know what it's like to need ten dollars. People don't know what it's like to starve. They so let like, me ask well, you this. Let, let me ask you yeah. this though. Cause yeah. you around Puffy. You know what I'm saying? Like, if he was taking care of his people, you wouldn't need ten dollars, right? Yeah. So that 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 so so y'all really didn't have a good relationship then. No, not at all. Black Rob was around Puffy. Yeah. What was he doing breaking in the hotel rooms and stuff and getting arrested for cat burglary? So look, so look, I heard, I heard, it was an interview, I heard you and G, right? Right, right. And y'all said Puffy's been the biggest gangster in New York. Might be. I and might have. You, you, you really believe that? You He, he heavy yeah, like that? Yeah, because, because what, what's happening is you don't have to look at gangster and be like, gangster is somebody who walking around claiming a set or a block or a color. Gangster is really about somebody who's standing on business, as T.I. son would say. Yeah. Um, you know what I mean? A gangster, we stand, that means like I represent my business. I represent, you know, how much, how much, how much bread I'm gonna bring home, how many bills I'm gonna be able to pay. Gangster is being able to handle and support yourself without having to fall sometimes, you know what I mean? But it's different. So gangster don't mean that we running around with a group of people. And if gangster means I'm going to handle my business, I'm going to always make sure I eat. For the whole 52 years I've been living, I probably only missed three meals my whole life. But see, That's look. That don't sound like the definition of gangster that, you know what I'm saying? Because from what I heard, he was terrorizing. People were scared of him, man. But when you stand on your business and somebody comes to you with that kind of attitude, you say, hey, that might work on those people over there. Okay. Over there. But if you come over here and try that, boy, you ain't going to really get too far with that one. Yeah. Yeah, we, we stand on God business. Yeah. And I, that's one thing I want to say. Shout out to T.I., man. Yo, I love T.I. Yeah. yeah no, I love how he raising his family. I love his one son that, that does the rap music. And he's incredible. Damani. Damani is he the truth. Yo, hey man, I really like that. He 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 really lets me know from his walk that we are able to teach our children right. He's yeah, he's, he's like he he reminds me of like, damn man, this is hard work. You know, but I'ma tell you something. You, hey, but I'ma tell you something though. You said something at the up? beginning. We all have a choice. You get what I'm saying? We all have a choice. And he's a prime example that no matter where you come from, even like for me to see how humble he is coming from a place of, you know, his parents are T.I. and Tiny. But he's still, you know, he's still humble with it. You know what I'm saying? That's a choice that he made, man. Right. It's a choice that he made. Definitely is a choice that he made. But what we realize is the most important part of life to us is to to we don't hold our children responsible of making choices on their own we got a guy let me give you this real fast i got to put this phone down it's not doing what i wanted to do all right we all are able to make you know to make choices in life but before we are allowed to make choices in life we need to be trained and we need guidance yeah. So once you get to a certain point to where you think you can be voiceless and, and, and voice your opinion 
and show the world, you know, the difference between you and the way you think and you're voiceless about it, you have to make sure that you've been trained and guided right. And you have to watch, like even me, everything that we say to the world um, is being heard. So we sometimes we got to be careful about the things we say. Even if our truth is the truth, we still got to be careful about how we speak our truth. Man, let me ask you this. In, in, in a lot of your interviews that I, that I watch, man, I, I've heard you reference God a lot. Ooh, you wow. know what I'm saying? A lot. Yeah. I've noticed yeah. that a lot about you. Yeah. Is this, is this like a way of you righting your wrong too? This is a way. By helping of, somebody else get justice? My wrong? My wrong? Huh? You say my R W R O N G wrong? Yeah, like any wrong you've done. You know what I'm saying? One thing about meditation and the power of prayer is you can pray about it before you get into it. Mm. But once you into it and you gotta pray, that means it's a little too late. Yeah. Now you gotta double pray. That means you gotta pray for to be heard. And you got to pray to be heard right now. So I always prayed about it before I encountered it. It's just a different kind of spiritual realm where a lot yeah. of people, some, some people don't aren't able to tap into this kind of realm. And this is how I created my music because I would have to think in advance. I would have to think like people 10 years from now in order to write a song to be a hit. I got to think about what people might be thinking 15 years from now, not right now. Right yeah. now, this is what they on. But in order to have a hit, we got to think about what they need to be on or what they're going to be on 15, 20, well, however many years later. So I, was, I always thought about that kind of stuff. Um, yeah. But I want to make sure I, I get to your question and make sure I answer it because I thought I may have done it in a roundabout way. But what was that question again? I said, you know, being that, you know, you speak a lot about God, right? And uh, now you you know you speaking out of, uh, uh, against all the stuff that's going wrong. Was this a way of you writing your wrong? I would never write my wrong. The wrong that I have in my my heart and in my chest, I would deal with it personally, and I would go get on my knees and I would pray, and I would ask God for guidance. I would ask Him for understanding, and I would ask Him for the wisdom to be able to understand. And um, I, I never faulted anybody else for my fall. I just, and I never looked at myself as I was in a, a place where I made a mistake. I always looked at myself and I said, you know, um, when you think about being a winner, can you give me one second? Yeah. Get out of here. Get out of here, come on, come on, come on. You're chewing, I don't want to hear that chewing. And do not get on my bed. And you remember my dogs. I got big dogs. I, I'm going to show you. I'm going to let you interview them a minute. But uh, going back, where were we at? I'm going to get back to it. Uh, when I was talking about writing your wrong. Yeah, writing wrongs. I think I might have touched on it. But, you know, sometimes when we talk and we, when we speak in God's speed, and we are able to just be a vessel for a message. We can't, we, I'm not using me to say something. I'm using me as a vessel for something higher than me to say something. And that's yeah. how I always did with my lyrics. And sometimes when the highest thing says it, if you, you have to just say it as fast as it comes to you or it's not for you to remember. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. So I always speak of God every time because when I speak of God, I don't speak of something that I pray to in the sky. I don't speak of something that, you know, I speak of you and me and I, and I speak about the things that we can possibly do together that's positive to change the world. And I believe that God is in you and I. So I don't look, I don't look past my nose to find God. Yeah. So I always speak of that because the only thing I had in life 
when I felt like I was down, when I was going through my situation with, you know, my crisis with um, feeling that I'm talented and then maybe had made the wrong business decision and or maybe had trusted in the wrong individuals, the only thing that I could do is believe in myself still. I never gave up on me. Yeah. And so when I think about that, that's when I found God. When I found God, it might be a good question for you to ask. You know what I'm saying? And everybody has one of those those stories to tell. Like, if you can ask a lot of people, at what point in time in life did you find God? Yeah. Let me ask you that. When did you find God? Man, I was in prison. Oh! I was a kid. I was in prison. I was in solitary confinement. How many years? Time. I did six years. Do you know that the average person could not think or they would kill themselves before they did six years? But did yeah, you, know, but you after know you did yeah, after you did six years, you know you here now as a living testimony now? Yeah, but you know, I, I tell people all the time, man, like that was the greatest part of my life, man. Like that that was yeah. one of the greatest things that happened to me. Because if I hadn't went to prison, I would have been dead, man. I was right. I was a kid trying to be grown, you know. I, I, I that's that's what my platform is about. I speak truth, you know. I give my truth. I don't mind letting people see my flaws. I don't mind letting people, you know. I'm I'm, I'm very intelligent. God has given me a lot of wisdom. You don't gain wisdom by reading books. You gain wisdom by going through things, man. And God has taken me through a lot of things, man. But that's when I found God, though. In a cell by myself. I couldn't get no letters. I couldn't get no mail. I couldn't get no call. I couldn't get nothing. You know what I'm saying? I ain't have nobody to talk to but him. And he showed himself to me. Right. So then when you see that, he told you something, right? Yeah. And you listen to it, right? Yeah. Everybody don't have that relationship with that energy. Exactly. And so you can't expect for them to be, you be like, look, if you ain't hear it, that means... You ain't talking it loud enough. Yeah. So everybody don't supposed to win what you work hard for. It's some, and that's life. You know, but when you have those that are anointed, those that are, are blessed, those with are blessed with the ability, talented, you do not mess with the anointed. And in this case, we have in a situation where a man has messed with the anointed. Yeah. And it's going to come back because you should not mess with the anointed. And what's the other saying? It said, um, my uh, prophets. Touch not my anointed and do my prophets no harm. Say it again so the people can hear it. Touch not my anointed and do my prophets no harm. Can I ask you a question? Go ahead. Reverse interview time. Can you explain that to me and to the people so they can know? So... God has, everybody, everybody is chosen by God. You know what I'm saying? But not everybody's anointed for their assignment. You know what I'm saying? And when God appoints certain people for certain uh, tasks, he has a certain protection and covering over them. And you are not to interfere with what they got going on. They ain't got to worry about fighting the battles because he's going to fight it for them. He sent them on assignment to do whatever it is that he wants them to do. So there's nothing you can do to try to, you know, you you can try, but the only person that's going to suffer from it is you. You know what I'm saying? As, in a nutshell, that's pretty much what it means. Wow, man. I could tell when you, you, you're you a very blessed brother. That was a real good answer. Man, I, I appreciate hope everybody it. got a chance to listen to that. So when you're anointed, you're anointed. Man can't touch you. You better not. Yeah. We are anointed. We the ones. Yeah. But... The world thought that they was the ones. And they said, hey, the world, let's let not let the world know about them because if we let them know about them, then what's going to happen is we don't mean anything. Yeah. So you're like, wow, you so, you so far built and, and stuck into yourself that you won't let the good energy go? You won't let the win, win, win? Man, you, you know, hey, you know, you know, just to, just to, you know, touch on, since we talking about the word real quick, right? 
just to give a little lesson. A lot of people that scream Jesus, 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 right? Mm -hmm. If he was living today, they would hate him. Wouldn't nobody listen to him. Let me show, let me show you, let me show you why. Jesus wasn't rich. Jesus was a common man. Oh, yeah. Jesus was a carpenter, man. So imagine a carpenter today telling you, check this out. Imagine a carpenter today telling a carpenter. you, follow me. I know the way. How many people yeah. are going to listen to that carpenter? You want me to tell you why? Because he don't look like exactly. So everybody that screamed Jesus, 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 if he was alive today, they'll crucify him too. They'll say he was stupid. They wouldn't want to listen to him. You want me to tell you why? Because he didn't come looking like the savior that they wanted him to look like. And oftentimes, if you read in the Bible, the people that God used to change things never come looking like what you think they supposed to look like. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So I got one good for you. Go ahead. All right, so... And we're not, we, this is not, no, for, if you actually, I don't have a religion. A religion is a study that man needs to use in order to better understand God. I don't have to have a religion to understand the truth. So I can bypass the middleman and go straight to the source. That means I can sit with my father. I don't need to ask for permission. Right. All right, so. I was I had a question today with a friend of mine, and we were talking about um, in order for God to walk with you, if you say, God, you know, I want you to be a part of my everyday walk. I want you to be in my life. I want you to bless me, bless my family, help me understand, help me grow, help me be a better person, help me be a husband. Help me be a brother. Help me be all of the positive things that people need to see in a man. So I said, okay. He said, in order for you to walk with me, these are the things you're going to have to do. And you'd be like, I bet. He'd be like, we're not going to the strip club. You'd be like, God, we're not going to the strip club? He'd be like, why? You'd be like, why? He'd be like, because the strip club is not a place for me. And you'd be like, all right, well, we can go, we can go over to the uh, to the club. He said, we're not going to the club. You'd be like, why? He said, because the club is not a place for me. And then you say, okay, well, where can we meet and enjoy each other's time? Because the only thing I want to do is focus on being closer to be with you so that I live and I'm blessed and I'm able to bless others around me. I'm able to pay people's bills when they need it. I'm helping people to pay their car notes when they need it. I'm helping to feed children when they're starving. I'm helping to put clothes on people's backs when they're cold. I'm, I'm here to put rules over people's head who sleep in the rain. I'm talking about my purpose in life is way bigger than being an artist. So God say, in order for you to be with me, first you're gonna to have to suffer. And you say, why well, I gotta suffer? And he say, because when you suffer, it's a lot of people that's watching you. And it's a lot of people that's looking up to you that are also suffering, but you're there to give them strength and to let them know that everything is gonna be okay because I said so. So you'd be like, damn, in order for me to be with you, I gotta suffer? He'd be like, yeah. So in order for me to be with him, what else I gotta give up? He said, you're not gonna be, you're not gonna be able to have what you want and have all of these girls and all of that. What I'm gonna need you to do is figure out how to love one lady. I need you to be a grown man because the things that you are asking for, you cannot run around in this streets, in these streets right here, with the things you want and single, because they're gonna eat you up. You be like, who? The other end. So when you start understanding it and you start putting everything into perspective, it start making sense. Yeah. So in order to be that great pre that great person, you are or I am or what we are trying to be, it, it's gonna take us to suffer. Yeah. Suffering don't last long. It just it just shows your faith. Like, when did you want to give up and say enough is enough? I give up. I'm going to go to the other side. You be like, damn, he gave up. Let him out. Let him out. But sometimes you'll be there. You'll be like, yo, I eat. I eat. 
you got to think like this. Yo, I eat pain, yo. I put that shit on bread, put mustard and ketchup on it, eat pain. <laughs> what problems? What? Bring them on. I, I, I punch problems like this. You know what I'm saying? This is what I do to problems. Uh, uh, uh. So you know what I'm saying? So when you think like that, you be like, there's nothing that no one can send to me that I am not able to handle because I am on God's team. Yeah. Yeah. So look, let's get back to the uh to some questions I had. Okay, let's roll with them. Earlier this week, earlier, I think today, mm -hmm. uh uh a, a interview broke where a, from five years ago they had arrested a dude for shooting up something that had something to do with Trump and he said that him the same thing that Cassie said he said five years ago do you believe that there's some truth to that? Where there's smoke there's fire what yeah. I will say is this we don't know like, I can be here to really be like and take the advantage of this opportunity to really drag him in and really take advantage and be like, let me just get back at him. Like, for everything you've done wrong to me, let me just go ahead on it. And look, and let's so, be clear. That's not, what, that's not what I want you to do. I'm just asking. That's not what we're going to do. It. That's not what we're going to do. And I understand what you said because me, you already been through the system. So you yeah. already know what it's yeah. like being accused. Let's not accuse him until he's been through a fair judicial system. And the only thing we can do is say, hey, he's innocent until they say he's guilty. And if yeah. they rack up all the information on him, if they rack up cases on him, then those are the mistakes that he made in his life that have been documented, that don't have nothing to do with our walk. Yeah. You know, um, I, I pray that, you know, that, everything should be okay i don't hate them to the to the point to where i feel like send them to prison or yeah. take take them away from his family i'd be like leave that man with his family every man needs to be with his family as long as he, he wants to commit to that yeah so as long you know it just depends on how his heart is and how he stands with right on if he's standing right, he's going to win. Right. Right. So uh, you you had interaction with Biggie, right? Say it again. I said you had some interaction with Biggie when you was at Bad Boy, right? We was in the same rooms at times. We shared, you know, the same space. But you got to remember at that time, I, I wasn't a, a starstruck on people. Yeah. And there was no stars in our days. Like, we had, like, Scarface, Ghetto Boys. I knew Scarface. We had Too Short. I knew Too Short. We had Red Man, and then I knew Red Man. So it's like there wasn't a such thing as somebody that was a star that I didn't know. Yeah. So it was like, uh, I, you know, it's almost like being around someone and you say, e even though you're a star, I just want to remind you that you're a friend and a person. So I, I'm not here for your autograph. I'm not here for the free mail. I'm not here to go to the club with you tonight. I'm not here because uh, uh, which vacations we've been on, with females we got. I'm here because I'm truly a friend of yours. And I don't yeah. care nothing about none of that stuff you got going on. I'm a friend. You know what so I mean? look, Bow Wow used to be signed to death row, right? Oh, yeah, don't say that. A lot... Is that true? Was Bow Wow signed to death row? I think Bow Wow was signed to death row. He was signed, definitely. I think he signed to death row early in his career when he first met Snoop. Now he first met Snoop. He was like 91 or something like that. I think, no, he was born in what, 87? 89? Yeah. Maybe 93. Somewhere up in there, whenever he um he started, he met Snoop at a concert in Ohio. And oh, so he was Snoop signed to Death Row first. Yeah, he was signed. Well, Snoop was was mentoring. I don't know what what he signed or whatever, but we know Bow Wow was with Snoop, and then um, 
he was with Snoop. And then from um, how it's been, you know, what, what it's been said as is um, what they call that word where people say they can use it as an excuse to say something. Um, what's uh, that one word? What's, what you say? It, they got this new word where people will say it and it means like just from what we read or what we hear, it's a word they'd be like, allegedly, allegedly. Yeah, allegedly. Allegedly is the word. Allegedly. Yeah. Allegedly, um, he was, um, Snoop discovered him one time and then he was working with him but didn't know what to do with him. And he didn't know how to market and promote him, similar to what they did me. And then for somehow, um, so so deaf, Jermaine Dupri signed him. Which is a cool dude. Jermaine Dupree is a cool dude. I know him. I've been knowing him for a long time. Yeah. Since John Pease or something. Yeah, I've been knowing him for a while. We never really did anything musically or we never really made money together. That was something that always confused me. Like, like why why can we both be great? Yeah. And never come together to do something greater. Not it's check this out. One, yeah, it's always one person thinking they better than another one or the other one thinking you'd be like, look, no matter how much money you got, no matter how many females you got, you understand? You has never great to be able to die size me, not saying anything of him, but at the end of the day, when you a fly guy, the girls is gonna like me and you, and they're gonna like me more than they like you. Yeah. I'm a fly guy. I'm a fly guy, I ain't really need to do, I ain't had to do no music and, you know, I was a fly guy. The girls automatically was attracted to me, you know, but that was just me. And I didn't really do it for the girls. That wasn't it. I did yeah. it for the me, me being me and making myself likable. You know, not for them. Yeah, I did it to be a grown man, to be a man, to be a man that, that, that to grow the way that I grew today to respect the woman. I respect women so crazy right now. I respect my lady so crazy. Look, check this out. Your boy G was talking about Suge and Jermaine Dupree. Uh huh. Did Suge really slap Jermaine Dupree? All right. I want you to notice that when when that part of the interview came up, did you see me sitting there? No. Nah. That's because that's his story and what he wants to tell. Okay. And I, I wouldn't have felt comfortable sitting and then because that's his story. Now I saw what I saw. So what did you see? What I saw when we was on the dance floor, well, it was on the dance floor, and when Suge was arguing with my my friend's wife, and he was and she knew him from LA, she was like, he was like, yeah, yeah, um, you out here with these East Coast parties and this this this. He was being real disrespectful in the club. So her husband, who's my friend told him, look, we don't come to your club tripping, whatever, and he got them escorted out at the club because they were really being belligerent and real aggressive in the club, but they was doing this around the wrong individuals. And as the night proceeded, and he escorted them out, unfortunately, Jake lost his life. And I saw that, and I saw the whole underplay for the overplay. I saw, I saw what was going on. I saw who did the shooting. I looked at him in the eyes and I was saying to him while he was doing it, please don't shoot me, sir. Please don't shoot me, mister. You know what I mean? And then- Hey, you, the hey, 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 don't, hey, hey, don't say his name, man. No, he's dead. Oh, okay. He died, he died. That's why. I can speak on the situation. He, oh, he died gone. like, huh? He gone. Yeah, he died like maybe so shortly after, maybe two weeks, a week after. Yeah. He died. He died. So I'm able to tell the story. Man, you hey, you want to tell that story? I just I know said the people, the people are love to hear. The story is, it was just that. He, um... He was at the, it was a dude who was at the bar. He's Jamaican, like part Jamaican, whatever. 
and it was a confrontation. And the guy who left, I obviously felt disrespected about the situation. And he wasn't the kind of person that would allow that kind of disrespect. He made his decision to finish his drink and walk out the club. He left the club. And then as everybody else exited the club, he reappeared. And when he reappeared, he reappeared shooting. And I was there. But I wouldn't be able to speak on this if this man was still alive. But I do know one thing. At the end of the day, I never really seen too many people who do things like this that didn't have things like that happen to them. And yeah. it happened so fast. Like, people who kill people get killed. You live by the sword, you die by the sword. And that's something we got to change in our lives and say, you know what? I don't want to live by that sword. I want to put the sword down. Man, let me ask you something. I got to ask you this. I ain't gonna, it, it wouldn't be right Come if on. I didn't ask you this. Let's roll. When, when, when you guys, when, when y'all was rapping, when, when hip hop was hip hop back then, right? Yep. Do you, are you guys like being like you, you are elder statesman in, in hip hop, you know what I'm saying? A pioneer with one of the biggest labels that's been around, right? Mm -hmm. Are you disappointed in where hip hop is now? Hell with all yeah. the killing and all of that? Hell yeah. I'm disgusted. Do you do you do you feel like do you cause it's you know you it's a lot of it's a lot of people and I think they do it to try to be politically correct. It's a lot of older guys that be like, yeah, man, I love what these young guys are doing right now. I love what they're doing, man, but all they talking about is killing. So how can you love that? You know what I'm saying? Right. So from your point of view, what do you feel about the state of hip hop right now? I feel like all of those younger individuals who thought that that was it needed guidance. And I feel like we weren't able to be there for them to guide them correctly sometimes. And I don't always fault them. I fault maybe us for not being able to be there because like you've been to prison and everybody's been to prison. And then so you say, hey, while you were spending time in prison, what was your children doing? For that 67 years you was down, who was raising your children? The school system. So they said, hey, let's take him away from the kids so we can have an opportunity to shape and mold their minds and make them believe in the world. So then when you come home, you be like, damn, I'm a nigga who took a chance. I broke the system. I, they said, don't do this. And I did that because I knew what I had to do in order to make to make a life and make, make put food on the table. So now it's a big difference. It's a big difference. We took risk. You know what I'm talking about? We took risk. And, and, and for the only reason why we took risks is to be better fathers, not to be club goers, people who throwing money in the air at the club. You'd be like, are you in the strip club throwing all your hard earned money in the air? Are you stupid? If you come from my area, we'd be like, yo, sweep all that money up, man. You get in the car, get him out of here. Yo, do not put money in his hands ever. Yeah. That's how, cause we owe, you know, when you over someone, you can guide them. So I feel like they've been misguided. I feel like they've been misguided. And I feel like the world is taking advantage of it because now the people who sing in these songs that's putting these this energy out in the world, those is our children. And they saying, uh, my booty hole brown. If I listen to it, my daughter sing a song about her booty hole's brown, do you know I would never say that's my daughter? People be like, that's your daughter. I'd be like, no, the hell it ain't. That's the girl from the ground booty hole. I don't know her. I'm yeah. not going to be like, yeah, that's my daughter. She's coming over to cook a pineapple upside down cake tonight. <laughs> I'm not eating that damn cake with her nasty ass hands. Her rap song seemed like, man, I'm not fucking with her. I swear I love you. But if we can go to a dollar cafe or something, we ain't going to be doing it like this. Yeah. So they separated us with that shit, man. They made us not believe in us no more. We don't have no goddamn family. Like, just imagine what her daddy like. Hey, uh, your daughter said a booty hose brown. How you feel about that? Put the mic in his face. He'd be like, uh, she just Western Union me. Yeah. You'd be like, 
nigga, you so old school, she Western Union, you. Where's your cash at? Where's your Zell? Yeah. Oh, no, we still doing money gram in Western Union. Wow, you ain't, ain't spending enough time with your daughter letting her know how much you love her and, and, and that everything she do out in that world represents you and how she been raised. We haven't raised our young men, I feel, but it's not too late. It's this time for us to come back on people like 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 Young Thug and say, you know what, Young Thug, I'm not going to condemn you. I'm not going to give up on you. I'm an OG. I'm going I'm to hold my, myself responsible, too, because I wished that I could have been a mentor or someone that could have helped you make another decision in life. And we're not going to fault you for whatever decision because nobody can say you wrong until you've been through court. So what I do is I'm going to stand by you until you come home. It's just like with Roger Bonds and Roger yeah. Bonds' son that he's in, in jail in Africa. And for all of these years, the only thing he's been fighting for is to bring his son home, you know? And he's been asking for help. He's been Puff security. And, you know, Puff, you can give him the money to go get a lawyer to make sure he has the defense that he needs. But why are we not supporting each other? Why is your head of your security struggling in this situation and you're not coming through to help him? Like, if somebody walked into this room and said, hey, I'm the killer, and then they jumped in front of you, he's somebody who's going to jump in front of the bullet for you. But when he's going through something, you're not willing to jump in front of you. are not willing to help. So, you know what? It don't matter. We're not going to sit here and stop on that. We're going to keep going. So We're look, check this out. So, so look, I'm glad you said, I'm glad you, you talked about him because it's a lot of people that uh, they think that's, that's his only motivation for coming out and speaking because of the situation with his son. You know what I'm saying? Do you feel like that? No, definitely not because this has been going on with him for, I think, 19 or 20. His son's been locked up in Africa for over, if I'm not mistaken, over 15 years. What did he do? And he was young. It was, you got to read into the case. It was a case where um, they, um, it was a, 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 a murder and um, they said that he may have been involved in it, but there's no weapon, there's no proof into it. It's just a lot of hearsay. And he's from the United States and he's in Africa. And so then it's, it's between him getting a fair trial for his son to bring his son home, you know, versus leaving him there and say, you know, I'll turn your back on you. He's not turning his back on his son, which yeah. is, I commend him, yo. He is almost like a superhero to me. Wow. I, you know what? I ain't gonna say almost. He's a superhero to me. And that's a friend of Puffs that was his security that said, hey, I'd rather not take no interviews. I don't want to talk to people about what Puffy got going on. I want to talk about freeing my son. It's like when people talk to me, I'd be like, I don't know what Puff got going on. I could care less what he got going on. I want to talk about me and my book. Yeah. I don't care. I don't care. Um, Everybody doing, everybody got uh, domestic problems, uh, problems in a relationship. I ain't going to sit here and say he no wrong to anybody else. Do you know how many domestic violence cases came through on the board tonight throughout the world? Yeah. A lot of them. He's just one of them. So we can't never, we can't never get into that. I'm going to be 100 with you. Want me to keep 100? 100? Yeah, do that. Let me keep it 100 with you. I had just the other day between me and my wife having a disagreement. It came to different words. And then the police came. And But at the end of the day, they say, hey, man, we know that people argue and we know people have disagreements. Well, it's up to me and her to figure out what we're going to do. So either we're going to stay and love each other or we're going to keep on going at this. Me, I'm going to stay and love her. Because I'd be like, we've been through too much to get to where we are right now to give up or fail now. We yeah. are not going to ever fail this late in the game. I'm 52. I ain't ready to fail no more. Yeah. It's just yeah. an understanding. It's about growing as a man. Has Puff grown as a man? Uh, obviously, not too much. 
when you grow as a man, you have a wife, dog, kids, house, all of that. It's like, how can you be a man? You got to have a woman. Every man, that every every good man has a strong woman in his corner. Facts. You can't be a good man and don't have a woman that respect, and you respect her too. And we're going to need some dogs. Because when you feel like you can go out to the club, you can go out for two days in a row, hell no, you got to feed them damn dogs. Yeah. Your ass got to go home today because your dogs got to eat. Man, look, let me ask you this. Real fast. Let me me ask you this. I want to tell you something. I want to tell you something real quick, then you can ask me that. I remember, you ever seen a dude when in a relationship, he buy his girl a dog? Yeah. And they be like, oh, he bought me a dog. And he's so cute. Do you know that's just another way to make sure she stay in the house, don't talk to nobody else, and just take care of that dog. It's like giving a woman a child. Yeah. So a lot of insecure guys give women pets as gifts. Let's go. Beware your Christmas gift, ladies. Do not accept pets. Let's go. Man, uh, what was your last day like leaving Bad Boy? What was that day? I was feeling good. I was like, I feel free. I feel like I'm me. I'm feeling like, I'm man. saying like, no, I'm saying like, had you already been thinking about the decision? Like, hey, man, I'm walking in the office. I'm turning over desk today. I'm, you know what I'm saying? Like, what was it? I was like, you an idiot if you don't see me. You an idiot if you don't understand what kind of talent I got. You an idiot if you don't really understand within me as God. So when you tell me I can't, boy, you denying God a whole bunch of privileges. Are you sure you want to deny God of these privileges? He'd be like, yeah, I can make these decisions. You'd be like, bro, you cannot make those kind of decisions over the anointing. And then he did it. And then you have to be patient. And then today is the day. Today is what he's going through right now for dealing with the anointing the way he dealt with it. He could have changed it. Yeah. He could have been different. You don't want to deal with people who gifted that that's been placed in this world for a purpose. You want to pl- you want to treat them wrong. Okay. Yeah. Hey, did you did he give you back your royalties? He never gave me back my royalties because he never had a lot of them. He only had what he can get for this part that he still is just little parts. He yeah. never really had like I didn't have a record deal to recoup for with him for. I'd be like, recoup for what? Only thing he did was pay for my, my bills. I think Bad Boy paid for my bills for about five years in a row. Yeah. I never had to worry about no bills. But at the same time, I wasn't making money. So it was like, damn, it's like the hush money. It's like, if we got a $300,000 budget for you, only thing we got to do is take 40000 or 50000 pay your bills for five years, and then next thing you know, you know, we, we can spend the rest of the 250. You'll never see it. It's gonna take you five years to wake up. Did you did you know that then or you you found that that found that out later? I knew that then because I was like, damn, I can't get in the studio, but we're gonna pay my bills. I can't put out no album, but why do we keep paying my bills and I'm not able to be that artist? Like, don't just pay my bills. That's easy. Your bills might be twelve hundred a month. Yeah. So why you ain't you get the money? Five. That's five thousand dollars a month times times that times twelve months. Five thousand times twelve is what? About sixty thousand. Yeah. Times five. That's three hundred. By the time you take the three hundred, and then you got a deal. You might know. You you might go to the parent label, and and what, that's just spending my three hundred. Yeah. So, so look, let's dive into the book before we get up out of here, man. Let's go. What made you decide to write the book? Because when I wrote the book, I'm telling my truth, and that's able. that was able for me to put the words that I felt in my heart and the words that were going through my mind and to put my pain on paper. So what I did was I said, everything that's going to stress me, I'm going to put on paper. And that's something that I always done. Like, whenever I'm going through something, I just get a piece of paper and a pen, and I just start writing 
words and things that remind myself that how important I am. I start thinking of everything that I love, all my children, all my people that, that love me back. And then after I read it, I say, there's no reason for me to feel like I'm nobody because I, I, I see how I'm appreciated. So it was almost like if you think, and I don't want to keep pulling God into it, but if we back it down to what I said, and you, you, you're playing with the anointed. So that means what made me have the fire that came out in me was that you're playing with somebody that God blessed. And you do not have the power to play with me, boy. You don't have the power to play with me. You don't yeah. have the power to play with me. You know, and, and, and it took me from all the way then to now to, to really get that understood with him. Like, if you ask him, Puffy, what's one thing that you might change if you can make the world different for you, for you today? He'd be like, the way I treat people, and I would never underestimate the power of God. And I'd be like, amen. Now yeah. I forgive you, boy. Yeah. I forgive you, boy. Yeah. What was the uh what was the process of like uh writing a book? Did you actually write everything out yourself? Did you have a writer? Like what was the process of writing it? Yo, know, I wrote the book out myself, but I had a writer, his name was Carl Evans, and I met him through the Herman Agency which was a, a literary agency that wanted to pick up my project. And they were trying to shop this book. But the Herman Agency is the same agency that did, that did Jack Canfield on Chicken Soup for the Soul. And they, they also had something to do with that movie, The Secret, you know, the documentary, The Secret, on how to change. You know, it's a lot of good things in that movie, that documentary, The Secret. So they did that. And they put me with a writer named Carl Evans. And Carl Evans wrote... Um, a book called uh, The Judas Factor, uh, The Rise and Fall of Elijah Muhammad and The Plot to Assassinate Malcolm X. He wrote two books that were incredible. And um, he's out of DC and he was an editor for the Washington Post, lead editor. And when we got together and he was able to verify all of the information that I was talking about, plus at the back, um, reference everything. Yeah. I could, I could just talk the truth and I can talk my story and he went and verified the facts of it. So ever in life, if the project picks up to it, because it, it hasn't been one that was the box office success, it didn't really hit and take off to be successful when we released it in 2009. What it took from 2009 to now for people to pay attention to it. So as we grow, I always come back to give Mr. Carl Evans his flowers. And also, as we grow, he's going to be more pulled into this venture. And we're going to come back together. And we're going to celebrate what we worked on together so hard. And yeah, we're going to, yeah, I'm, I come back to bless that brother. Yeah. That brother and his family. That's yes. what's up, man. Yep. That's Carl Evans. Yeah. Where can they get the book from? Well, if you want to get the autograph book, you can get it from my DM and my Instagram DM. It's, it's, and it's at, um, at M-A-R-K-K, one more time, C-U-R-R-Y. Please put that in the bio when you get a chance, right? And then I want you to put the link to the book in the, um, and down on below so when people see the interview, they can go right, click in, grab a book, or DM you the autograph. Yeah, the autograph copy. They could DM you. Yeah. I got you. They can DM you on me and they can get the autograph book. Get the autograph book for Christmas because yeah. that's what we need. So, look, man, before we get out of here, first of all, I want to let you know, man, I appreciate you, Mark. You know what I'm saying? I reached out to you. You hit me right back. You know what I'm saying? And I appreciate you, man. I I, I thank you for taking time out to sit down and talk to me, share some insight. Uh, Man, before we go, man, you, you want to talk a little bit about the illegals? Ooh, you talking about the group that was signed to Rowdy? Yeah. Lil Jamal and Malik. Yeah. Rowdy Records. Man, it was a rap group. They came out of Atlanta. They was signed under Arista and Rowdy Record, the imprint. And it was Lil Jamal and Illegal. And they were a Left Eyes Project kind of like. 
and Left Eye and Eric Sermon were at a time dating. And so I think Left Eye had um, got guardianship over Jamal and Jamal came from Philly and Left Eye came from Philly and Jamal was writing lyrics for her when he was in juvenile. And uh, when he came to Atlanta, uh, she sent him to Atlanta, and I think she had him living with her and everything. But that's like one of the first rap groups, it, other than Crisscross. That was the epitome of Crisscross. So it was illegal, and then Jermaine Dupri had Crisscross, and then also Dallas had ABC. Kid group. Yeah, another bad creation. Another bad creation. Yeah, and then you had illegal. Which was these was two little grown ass kids for real. Yeah. Right? And their story and the history and what they mean to the city is so important that you you know what you gotta do? You just gotta interview Jamal. You gotta interview Jamal one day. I could set that up for you. Man, let's make it happen. Tell you about the, yeah, let him tell you about the history of this city right here and then how it comes about. It's gonna be incredible. Yeah. Man, let's make it happen, man. Yes, sir. Let's make it happen, man. We'll Say do it. Again. Well, let's put it together. His All right, name cool. is, is a Jamal Phillips. Okay. Right? Send me, send gonna, me his page. I'm going to get it to you. And the world needs to know about this. This man, to see him go through the things that he went through from a child all the way to now, He's in my book. I want y'all to read that book. Get that book because I got a good, when you ask him, ask him about the story in the book. Let him tell you. But to sit back and watch him and to see how he overcame and to see him overcome situations, man. I'm talking about, man, y'all going to love this little kid. Not, not a little kid. He's a grown man now. But you're going to love his story. I'm excited, man. Let's make it happen. Let's go. Until next time, man. I appreciate you, man. Thank you guys for tuning in, man. I'm out. Yes, sir. Good night, all.